Hi, I am the uh, disembodied voice of uh, Jeff DeLeo. Uh, I work at NCC Group. And I am Addison Amiri. I used to work at NCC Group. And uh, while uh, uh, Addison was at NCC, we started this research into uh, DRuby, uh, which is a remote object invocation library API uh, that's built into the Ruby standard library. It's used by a couple of random things, but often sees more use in ad hoc code um, that's not necessarily open source. Um, so a while back, uh, we were working on some Java instrumentation stuff that involved JRuby and had a REPL. It was really fancy. And we were testing it, uh, and we found that this DRuby stuff was being used by one of the dependencies. So we started looking at it because uh, this was going to be used to assess you know, and reverse engineer things. It would be bad if uh, something on the device under test could then compromise the remote system uh, auditing it. So uh, we found uh, that a lot of uh, different things, it was, it was already kind of known to be insecure from the docs, um, but you know, high level overview of what we're gonna talk about. Uh, obviously a remote method invocation, uh, custom binary protocol, uh, object serialization, and a client server are really server-server peer-to-peer interactions. Um, so to just kind of jump into a very simple example um, of the code, um, you have on the left side uh, here this server uh, code that exposes a front object that is just a Ruby object. Um, it's an instance of, of, an, of a class. And then on the right side, you have the client code, which uh, essentially opens up uh, through the, the DRB API to get a handle onto that object by a URL. Uh, and essentially, you have a proxy object there that is the time server on the right. And when you call things on it, they magically get transported over to the left side. And then it does some stuff. It returns a value that magically makes its way back to the right side. And then you have a value. So uh, how this is actually working is that the variable on the right side is not actually that real object. It is, in fact, a DRB object, which is a proxy wrapper. Um, and so essentially, you need this to uh, send calls over over things, uh, especially for values that can't be sent back and forth. Generally speaking, it's uh, used for the main interacting API object that's exposed, that front object. Uh, it contains two fields, a URI, which is the URI for the server where it resides, the actual object backing it resides, and then a reference, which is some sort of unique reference identifier on that server uh, process to uh, essentially forward calls and things to. Uh, by default, that's uh, just the Ruby object ID. And you can actually use this to wrap both local and remote objects. So you yourself could, in your own process, have a DRB object that points to your own process's DRB server and then call things through it. And the way that it functionally works is that uh, it overrides method missing, which in Ruby is the magic uh, catch-all uh, method that essentially any time you try to call something that doesn't isn't defined on an object, it goes to method missing. And if you've overwritten that, you can essentially handle all those calls and proxy them. Um, so the, the interesting thing about uh, this is that uh, the ID values that are, are passed back and forth, actually, there's no keeping track of that. Um, if you happen to know an ID value in a remote process, you can simply create a uh, crafted DRB object for it. And as long as the server is accessible, make calls to it. Um, that's, that's kind of not great. Um, it, it has no ability to track when it's kind of leased out a handle. And so you can just entirely avoid that front object by guessing IDs. Um, then uh, the other interesting thing about the code base is this DRB undumped mix-in that basically the way that the DRB, DRuby knows to uh, wrap an object instead of just serialize it, send it over, is that the serialization fails. So the easiest way to make that happen is to override the serialization method and force it to fail. And that's how, that's quite literally how it, you annotate your class to not be uh, serialized and get proxied instead. So we see here the, The distributed, the distributed object, object protocol, protocol is a distributed, distributed object, object protocol, protocol that, that uh, is, is unlike most distributed, distributed object, object protocols, protocols. A, a, like BitTorrent and stuff like that. There's no centralized registry. There's a, only a 
a client connecting to a server and uh, that's the only connection that's going through. So uh, we see these as a uh, unidirectional and uh, the, the server in this sense will send back a success message, whether the, the call succeeded or uh, failed and a uh, value for the call that's being happened. Now, uh, moving forward, the, the DRB message that's being called includes a reference to the object that's being called on. Now, this will be nil if the, the object is the front object of the, the DRB protocol, and uh, this will be integer if uh, this is some other object in object space. Uh, the method name is next. The method name is uh, included as a string. The arguments are next. And then fourth, there is this block that uh, is nil if there is no block. So uh, next we can we can look at the the DRuby uh, sort of code that goes on on both ends, and we can see that there's this time server that is like hosting this front object that we talked about the uh, that that responds to get current time, and we see the client, but the client's also hosting a service, and we'll we'll get to that in a little, but. Uh, here we have a, a uh, uh, get current time uh, call that's happening on this time server project. So here we can see the, the call flow going and we see that the, the object reference ID is nil, meaning that we're calling something on the front object. The get current time value is the function name that we're calling. We see args that are nothing because there are no args to this uh, um, to this method call, and then we see the time dot now value getting passed back to the to the current um, to the caller. So going forward, we can we can break this up, and we can see the actual uh, wire protocol that's happening here. And and in blue, we see uh, what's prefixed uh, a length of every message that's going across. So. So there's, there's multiple little bits that are coming across and each bit is uh, prefixed with, with an integer value that, that determines the number of bytes to read off of the wire. Um, each of these number of bytes is actually a uh, marshaled value, so a Ruby marshaled value. So we see the first one's three bytes and we, we can count there's three of them and so on and so forth. Going forward, uh, we see that um, the first one is 040830. This is the Marshall value for nil. So the 0408 is actually a, a prefix that's, a that's prepended to every Marshall value. That's the, that's the version number of Marshall. Um, and then the 30 is actually uh, the Marshall value of nil. And then going forward, we can see it's just, it's just a bunch of uh, straight up Marshall values. There's, there's nothing special going on here. Uh, first is nil, second is literally the string get current time, third is zero, meaning the, the number of arguments being passed over the wire, which is zero, and because there's zero arguments, the, the fourth one is the block, which because there's no block, there's nil. So, and then returned, there's true, get time instance, which is the current time that we called, and, and so on and so forth, it, that's, that's the time instance that we just got back. So uh, going forward, there is, uh, you can see that, um, so basically every call that you make on this object is, is essentially like tunneled into this object. So there, there's nothing special going on. Uh, there's nothing uh, stopping you from calling any, any method you want to. Everything is just uh, sort of, uh, tunneled into send and uh, you can see here that like we we pass a bunch of stuff in all of the stuff is decoded off of the wire this is this is code in DRB at this point um, and all of this code is just uh, passed into send and and there's nothing stopping us from just passing whatever we want essentially and uh, as a attacker this is this is something that like uh there's there's really nothing in your way from uh really doing anything you you feel like um there there's no protections in place there's no defenses or anything like that 
quick question for the, the audience. Is, is my slide um, updating on the screen share? Are we still stuck at um, remote method invocation? Uh, you're at send right now. OK. Um, I can, uh, yeah. So uh, at a high level, uh, are we on a load and load and load right now? Yes. OK, cool. So essentially, uh, the, the code that works calls this uh, load function over and over again to receive the request. And all that is doing is it's reading those four bytes of size, and then it uses them to read in the amount to, to read in for the Marshall value, and then it calls Marshall load on them. And uh, to pull out the arg v array, it just, for every number that the, uh, the arg c turns out to be, it just reads another value over and over again. Uh, and then the, uh, for the block, it just tries that one more time. So the interesting thing here, as, as we can see, is uh, from that, that code prior, uh, you can essentially just call anything on any object effectively um, once it gets translated from the ID. And uh, any, any message, uh, any, any method name you want, and any arguments you want. So that's, that's uh, pretty dangerous. Um, so basically, uh, in addition to being able to send basically anything you want because of how Marshall works, uh, the only real restriction with Marshall is that the other side has the class loaded so that it can know how to do the unmarshalling. But other than that, you can send any sort of object. Uh, so Marshall has a lot of gadget exploits associated with it that can be particularly troublesome. And there are basically no restrictions on the method you can call there. And uh, basically, you can do this from regular old Ruby code, um, which the documentation recommends a couple of things to lock this down that, as we will see, do not actually work. So uh, one of the uh, big things with the, the way that the Ruby code is based in the documentation for how the quote unquote exploit would work is that it does an undef on the uh, class or the object instance for the given method that you want to call so that the call falls through um, to be sent over. But as we mentioned, you can just call method missing directly um, on whatever you want, essentially. So taking this a step further, if you want to use any sort of unmarshal exploit uh, or unmarshal gadget here on the left, we see a, a gadget class, which is just an example of, let's say you had a gadget. This is a, this is a very trivial gadget that would be a, uh, implemented in the server. The client would be able to essentially return anything in that exploits this gadget and boom, the, the server uh, runs this code. And there's, there's really nothing stopping the client from returning anything like this that gets unmarshaled into whatever the client specifies. And uh, this, is, this is essentially the, the crux of the problem. So um, we can see on the, the, in the DRB library, you have a, a basically an ID to ref that is the, the integer that you pass back that that basically is any integer you pass back gets turned into whatever that object is on the server side. And if you pass back nil, it, it turns into the front object. But if you pass back an integer, then that turns into literally any object that's there. So um, here we can see that that there's no checks to make sure that there's uh, that the, that the object you're calling a method on was actually lent out to a remote process like. Like this can be any object ever created in the server process. And uh, also <laughs> because there are many objects that have static object IDs like nil that exist in every Ruby process. Nil has an object ID of eight. So you can specify eight. And because you can even call instance eval on nil, which uh, maybe shouldn't be a thing, who knows? But uh, um, it allows you to get uh, code execution. Uh, through this. So, so you can specify eight in order to, to call something on nil and uh, you can specify instance eval as the method and then boom. Um, so here we have uh, this, but um, you, you see that the, that in this very, very simple example that we're, we're demonstrating DRuby, uh, we also have the client starting a DRuby service, which uh, may raise some red flags in anyone watching. Um, this is something that uh, 
is uh, basically like um, a necessary through the protocol because if the client is uh, sort of sending any object that's local to the server, it needs to represent that local object through a, a DRB undumped reference. And it needs to allow the server to call methods on that object in case it needs to. And through that, it needs to start its own DRB server. So we have this sort of problem where um, the, the client is also sort of necessarily vulnerable to anything that we're talking about here. Here we see this, this fake uh, DRB server where it just opens up a TCP socket, accepts anything, and then uh, assuming the, in, in this simple example, assuming the client's running on Mac OS, which doesn't randomize port numbers, uh, you, can, you can just subtract one from the port number. If, if the client's not running on Mac OS, you can scan the host for, for wherever this DRB socket is and, and then get code execution on the client that's, that's actually calling something on you as, as this uh, pretend DRB server, which is a, a pretty big problem. So, so in order to scan for this process, like, like assuming they're not uh, trivially finding uh, a DRB server because, because port numbers aren't randomized, you, you can pretty easily scan for this. The only, the only problem is that uh, there's no banner like, like most uh, processes will have. Um, what, what you got to do instead is you, you just write random stuff to the socket. And, and when you write random stuff to the socket, boom, you get back stack traces. So it's pretty easy, pretty easy to figure out. You get back stack traces. Just to be sure, you can scan the stack traces that you get back for a DRB, DRB con error. And uh, that'll make sure that like, hey, you actually are dealing with a DRB type of thing. But but it's not it's not the the most difficult thing to to handle. So uh, to kind of sum it up, uh, this is just you know code execution via the protocol. It's, it's the feed, how it works. Uh, there are no application level vulnerabilities even needed to exploit these things, which is kind of already known. But what was not known was that you can do it to exploit the client. Uh, the particular foot guns here are the fact that you know you can send. Uh, arbitrarily, things like instance eval, the actual send uh, through various other means, and then uh, the Marshall deserialization and uh, the fact that you can pick an arbitrary object ID that is not the one that the server might try to harden. So uh, basically, it's real code execution as a service working entirely as intended. Uh, so what, what do we do now? Um, well, one recommendation is, is not to use uh, DRuby. Uh, instead, use something like gRPC. Uh, thank you for coming to our TED Talk. Um, alternatively, uh, you know, uh, there are people who can't uh, get off of it. So there are ways to, to deal with it. So uh, one thing early on to not do is uh, not rely on safe levels because, one, they don't exist anymore. Um, but this was something that used to be uh, thrown around as a recommendation for DRuby servers. Um, the problem is, is that none of the safe stuff really works. It breaks all the code. There are still, generally speaking, ways around it. Uh, but it doesn't matter anymore because it was removed in Ruby 2.7. Um, but the biggest annoyance with it was that it treated the disk as untrusted, meaning that when you loaded like gems, all the libraries you might care about to run your application, they just would not work, which was why no one used it and why it got pulled. Uh, so instead, what you're going to do is you're going to say patch DRuby. Not kidding here. Um, so there are a bunch of things that we want to kind of prevent certain kinds of abuses of. Um, so you can filter method IDs. Um, there are obviously ones that you might want to specifically allow, in which case you can restrict the ID filtering to those specific things. But alternatively, uh, there are also an absolute ton of dangerous um, methods and things that you probably do not want to allow. Um, next, uh, you're going to want to deal with marshalling by uh, constraining what can be sent over uh, to, say, safer types. Uh, then lastly, you've got to do something to track all of those object IDs so that people can't start calling things on nil, even though you never actually sent nil out. Um, because why would you? It's, it's a serializable value. Um, so we wrote a thing called drab, 
uh, the D, D Ruby uh, DRB for the boring. Um, it's a gem, basically a forked version of the, the DRB code base from Ruby itself. Uh, it's a drop-in replacement, but it speaks a different wire protocol. Uh, most of its features are about not having features. So uh, we remove weird things like the block handling. Uh, we remove, uh, so we add in method ID filtering to say, add in things that you would want to allow to happen specifically. Um, alternatively, we block a whole bunch of super dangerous methods. Um, oddly enough, DRuby actually does have its own uh, blacklist um, specifically for uh, the double underscore send, the true send. But uh, given that the way that it works is essentially by calling that true send, that kind of doesn't mean anything. You just can't send a send. Um, so that doesn't actually even block the regular send. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's not great. Um, so moving on, uh, we restrict marshalling by uh, converting everything over to JSON and uh, overriding how the loading implementation works. And then uh, we validate sort of these structures of bytes um, to be unmarshaled against uh, certain AST patterns that are the core structure of how Marshall works so that we can effectively validate certain types are being passed over um, and not other types. So things like arrays and strings and very basic objects and numbers and true false booleans and nil, but not really anything more dangerous than that. Uh, and then additionally, we easily track all the, um, the ID values back and forth. It's pretty simple, actually. So the thing that we kind of forgot to mention was that there are other, there's another big user category of uh, DRuby users, um, exploits. So uh, we, we should add Metasploit to this list of who uses DRuby. Um, so going through uh, the port, 8787 is the default port uh, that's recommended in documentation for DRuby. And uh, looking at it, you can see that it's it's uh, pretty open across the internet, except that most of these are all HTTP. So uh, it's not the biggest deal. And if you look at it, uh, Nmap used to recognize this type of thing, but um, doesn't do anything that, that we're sort of like, uh, we wish it would do in recognizing DRuby. So it, it's a bit unfortunate, but um, uh, nothing nothing really recognizes DRuby on the internet anymore. So um, basically uh, we're stuck with this uh, writing random nonsense to the socket and, and scanning the, the request, the response back in uh, finding out if something is actually running DRuby, which uh, maybe is better than it uh, just announcing itself on a port. But um, basically, uh, if we can do this, uh, if we can we can scan the internet, we can we can determine better than uh, Shodan or better than Nmap at this point uh, where there is DRuby on on the network. Um, the interesting thing about all of this is that uh, the internet effectively collectively lost its ability to scan for DRuby, which sort of coincided with us finding ways to write evil DRuby servers that exploit clients. So the internet kind of got lucky, um, alas. So uh, we're, we're here to change both of those things. Uh, so to kind of quickly review uh, the sets, the, uh, the existing exploits, um, the one from the official Ruby docs does the uh, undef of instance eval and then calls that. And this is actually a kind of ridiculous payload in general. Uh, they, they, this comment of unsafe code is actually from the docs, which is interesting because the unsafe is, is so true in so many ways. Because uh, if you have an auto exploiting gadget, uh, that could uh, pop this when it gets the return value uh, from the call to instance eval one, but also what I think this code was trying to say is that sending an RMRF uh, star command over to the remote server is unsafe and dangerous. Uh, and so I guess they tried to mitigate that by picking a non-default port, this 8989, which isn't even the standard DRuby port. So you'd be hard pressed to accidentally hit a DRuby server with this and nuke the box. Uh, interesting choice of default payload. I would have gone with like, I don't know, ID or something or uname. Uh, Metasploits, on the other hand, does functionally the same technique. 
by doing uh, the undef um, all the way at the bottom, except they do it for send so that they, uh, they can call send directly with a bunch of different things. So they will send for instance eval instead of doing uh, instance eval directly over DRuby. They'll over DRuby call send with an argument of instance eval, which functionally is effectively the same thing. Uh, but in slightly newer versions of, of DRuby uh, or of Metasploit, they took out that start service line. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so really all of these existing exploits are kind of super basic and they all end up going for instance eval and none of them really do anything fancy. The, the fanciest that Metasploit gets is that if I guess uh, someone were to overload instance eval, they uh, on that front object, they would default back to uh, calling syscall via send. But they don't do anything interesting like call instance eval on nil, which wouldn't really be blocked by anyone using this because you, you basically skip the front object and go for, in, go for in for the kill on the, um, the nil object on the remote side. So, and also none of these ever attempt to uh, act as evil servers to exploit clients, which is kind of sad. There's so much room for improvement. So uh, given all these things, I think it's safe to say that we've kind of shown that uh, you know, DRuby is unsafe uh, to use in general. So uh, obviously uh, we can just clearly, or we could connect to Metasploit's DRuby server to get code execution. Um, but there is so much more fun to be had with the deserialization gadgets, especially because Metasploit uses Rails and ActiveRecord and they're always available and loaded uh, and they have a completely stable, reliable gadget that basically can't be fixed at all. So uh, we had this payload that we wrote and sent as our POC to Metasploit. And you don't necessarily really need to know all that's going on here. It's, it's basically the quintessential um, uh, Rails gadget, which was often used for uh, abuse of serialized uh, signed cookie values. But the interesting thing is that up at the top, we detect if instance eval is the symbol being sent from our overridden send, and because that's all they're ever going, uh, that's all Metasploit ever calls on us. And if it is, we raise an exception, so they fall back to their next implementation uh, of a payload. And then we send back the gadget. And the gadget has a limitation that it requires something to be called on it. And luckily, uh, that second implementation uh, does a bunch of low-level syscall I/O. And it expects that certain things that come back are integers for uh, things to be reading or fi file descriptors to be reading from. So when it sends that back into DRB, it ends up causing the gadget to, to fire, uh, which basically then runs the arbitrary code. So we told uh, Metis, we reached out to Metasploit about their uh, all of their DRB problems, and uh, then they made that fix where they just commented out the server. So we told them specifically that that was a problem. But our payload was for the gadget. Like you would try to target our server as, as a victim uh, with Metasploit as a client. But our payload continued to work. They clearly never ran it uh, against the updated version. Um, we Then several weeks later, we reached out to them again. And uh, they removed the code entirely, which was our original recommendation because it wasn't salvageable. Uh, so we only have one CVE when arguably there were several versions vulnerable to multiple things. So personally, I think we should have two CVEs for this, but you know, whatever. Um, then the, the interesting thing here is that uh, obviously our exploit was actually still vulnerable to all the other attacks we've talked about. So if you really want to do this properly, uh, you have to re-implement the entire wire, wire protocol much more, shall we say, safely. So the safely is a lot more uh, work involved, but basically we we rewrote uh, the DRB protocol and library entirely into this DRB RV gem that that has now been published, which basically uh, uh, gives you as a library user a lot more power and control over what's exactly being sent over the protocol and uh, what's exactly being received from the protocol. And then additionally, we wrote partial, which is this uh, partial implementation of Ruby's Marshall, which uh, basically only implements like the, the smallest amount of Marshall necessary to do talk DRuby 
and uh, doesn't uh, instantiate these crazy objects like Active Record and stuff like that. And uh, the, these are both suitable for for messing around with the protocol if you if you are uh, so inclined to do so. So uh, here we have an example of uh, DRB RB using being used. So you open up a TCP socket, you tell it using DRB RB like exactly what to write. So so here we're taking the object ID of nil. We're we're giving it the string instance eval. We're telling it the exact arguments to put nil because there's no block it's just puts this is a very dangerous payload uh, assuming this is actually a very dangerous payload uh and that's being passed the instance eval on the on the server side so yeah. and uh you know having an evil client is, is simple everyone's been doing that for years uh the more interesting thing is having the evil server and so we have uh, an API for easily spinning up a server based off of uh, Ruby blocks, which is kind of the quintessential Rubyist way to do this. And effectively, it gives you a uh, view of everything. And uh, in our payloads, it's kind of similar to fire off gadgets into exceptions, as it turns out, because often uh, the Ruby, the DRuby handling of exceptions will call thing will call things on them, often triggering them to uh, to fire and, and run their code if they weren't auto run on deserialization in the first place. And the, uh, the output, or, or I guess the inputs to, to these handlers are slightly interesting because uh, we want to be able to handle arbitrary data coming in, even if we can't deserialize it with our safety serializer, which would mean it's probably dangerous to deserialize. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, for every argument or every piece of data that can come in as, as an input, uh, we have both the deserialized value or nil and the raw encoded form of the that we read off the wire. So you can detect if nil is actually nil or if nil was a failure to decode. Uh, but everything continues on and you can process as you need to. Um, so overall, we find that DRuby is just bad at security all over. And as it turns out, it's actually much less secure than the documentation would lead you to believe. And even the exploit example they gave you in that documentation is itself exploitable. So uh, yeah, don't use the real DRuby even in your exploits. Um, but there is some hope. Um, you know, for people who actually are stuck using uh, DRuby, uh, we you know wrote this drop-in wire incompatible replacement. So library, but every user of it that needs to talk to each other needs to be using uh, Drab. Uh, and then separately, we have a low-level wire compatible protocol handler uh, library for it. Or you know you just fall back to using something safe and simple like gRPC, modern. Uh, but at least we have uh, ways to safely write DRuby exploits now, which we did not previously. Um, DRB, RB, and partial are currently published and up on Ruby Gems. Uh, we will be publishing our main sort of DRuby exploit CLI script soon, um, and we are currently in the process of finishing up a Metasploit module to replace the original implementation that got uh, yanked. Um, an interesting thing to note about that is that the author of the original uh, vulnerable uh, DRB exploit that we exploited was actually the same person who wrote the universal, or sorry, the, um, the Rails deserialization gadget that we used to exploit it. So we exploited his own code with his own code. That was, uh, that was fun, actually, when we, when we realized it was the same person. Um, and all of our code is going to be up on uh, our, our repo uh, ncc group slash uh, drbrb um, on GitHub. Uh, so to complete the talk, and, and we're clearly out of time, uh, we would like to send out some minor greets to uh, Masatoshi Seki, who is the uh, creator and author of DRuby and uses it for a bunch of interesting uh, parallel and distributed computing things that seem to be getting uh, picked up by the Japanese uh, astrophysics uh, community. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, we might have exploits on very interesting pieces of software, as it turns out. Uh, he is similarly a Pokemon and Magikarp fan, uh, like myself. Um, so uh, we have ideally some camaraderie, uh, but also uh, Sumimasen. Uh, this uh, we, we've kind of uh, destroyed uh, DRuby entirely, but we are trying to keep the pieces from falling apart by having safe replacements so that people don't just stop using it because it does. it is actually very fun and, and easy and simple to build up very interesting distributed applications with.
It just needs more security. Um, and that is our talk. <laughs>